This podcast is brought to you with the kind support of Plutus Capital, a female-run investment management firm based in Evanston, Illinois, which works with clients in a wide variety of mandates such as custom diversity solutions, manager due diligence, diversified hedge fund to fund allocations, and advisory services. Our next guest is an investment professional, a city councilman of the City of London, and a leading voice in the city's Tackling Racism Task Force. Here are the complexities that this involves and how tapping into the community's voice is key to a sustainable solution. I'm Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Andrian Myers, who is a councilman in the City of London Corporation, as well as a head of pensions investments at the London Borough of Sutton and Royal Borough of Kingston upon Thames. He is a non-executive director of Resonance Limited, as well as a strategic business advisor to B Finance. Welcome, Andrian. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Ethan. So let's start with talking about where you grew up, what you studied, and how you came to enter the world of investing. That's an interesting question. So I actually grew up in India. So for some of you in the industry that that might know me, I come from a mixed background. My mom's side is Portuguese um, Indian. My dad's side is German Indian, with my two grandfathers being born in their respective countries of Portugal and England. My mom and dad were born in India, so was I. And up until 2001, when I finished my schooling, I actually lived in India and right at a very early age, year eight, year nine, I gathered, I had an aptitude for numbers. So always wanted to be an accountant. So followed that journey through, through GCSE accounting, A-level accounting, done my degree in accounting, and then got a job at the London Borough of Lambeth, straight out of university in their accounting department, and went on to be the deputy chief accountant, and later on head of housing finance. And then when there was a major restructure, it was deputy chief exec or section 151's idea he said, Andrew, you've done some good work for us. How about you try your hand out at Treasury and Pension Investments? And I thought, okay, that's, that's a new area for me. You know, I'm, I'm all for learning. Let's take this on board. So back in 2010, 2011, I got my feet wet in the world of investments as head of Treasury and Pensions for Lambert. And ever since then, have not looked back. So slightly long-winded answer, but I thought it was important that people knew my background and how I got involved in it. Absolutely. And now in your role as head of pensions investments in these authorities, what's at the forefront of your mind? What I've come to learn, and, and actually when I did get the job as head of treasury and pensions at Lambeth, I was all excited. How old would I have been? I would have been about 24, 25. A senior position, rushed home, told my dad and my mom, I was like, look, I'm, I'm looking after this 800 million pound fund, whatever, 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 right? Word of advice that my dad gave me, he said, listen, I don't care how many million you look after. Just make sure at the end of every month, you pay my pensions. So that message, I tell myself pretty much every day that no matter what happens, my objective and what's at the forefront of my mind is paying those benefits as and when they fall due. Because these are individuals who work in local government, contribute a lot into their pension board. And it's up to the team and I to make sure that we do not waste their money and we are good stewards of capital. So when their pensions are due, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Right. Never forgetting for whom we do this. I I think that's a very humbling reminder, certainly. And do you have any core investment beliefs in how you execute on that role? Yeah. So there are two or three core investment beliefs that I do have. One of them at the forefront is is obviously responsible investing. Not, I don't say ethical, social or governance. I say responsible investing because I think it covers everything. So whether it's from climate change, whether it's from a social perspective and diversity and inclusion, and whether it's just good governance. So I think the way in which we invest not just our money, but the money of our members should be done in a responsible manner. So so that's one core belief that I have. The second belief that I have is that uh, I do believe, and this is my personal views, I do believe in active management. I think there's value to be had. And depending on how we go about doing our due diligence and manager selection process, I think if that ties in with a really good active management strategy, there's room for that as well. The final one in terms of my own core in investment belief 
is that is to do with reporting and, and measurement. A, a lot of people say, oh, you know, your returns, if you look at the last year in, in the LGPS, for example, you know, are 22%. I was like, yeah, it's 22%, all well and good. But what risk have you taken? And what fee have you paid for it? So for me, the final investment belief would be when we do our assessment in terms of reporting, monitoring, we need to look at things in, in the round. And for that, I'll summarize by saying risk-adjusted net of fee returns. So I'll say those are my three core investment beliefs that I do have. There are many others, but these are the three that, that come to mind first. And just to follow up on one of those points, you mentioned focusing on net of fee returns. And obviously, it's the net returns that matter, but the fees that can grab the headlines, yeah. especially yeah. when it comes to, to local government and anything yeah. that, that's in the public sector. Do you have any position on fees? Are you driving for better transparency? Are you driving to get fees lower? What's your position on yes. that? Yes. So, so I, I don't know if you are aware, but when pooling first started, you know, the, the whole idea was that you know, we can get better fee savings when we do this. And along with seven other colleagues and myself back in 2011, 2012, we came up with the idea of pooling, which we set up in London. Bob Claxton actually was um, the brainchild behind this. And seven of us got together, came up with this idea, put it forward to government. You know, we set up the London Civ back then. And then a few years later, we have mandatory pooling. But the essence of it is to an extent to get better fees from pooling our investments together. Following that, done some work with the local government scheme advisory board as an advisor to them. And actually, the minister at the time was our current chancellor, Rishi Sunak, where we started work on the cost transparency template. Um, so looked at mainly the listed um, asset classes at the time to get better transparency as to how managers are reporting these fees. And the reason why we, why we started this project, was it three, four years ago now, was so that asset owners like myself can assess and see, are you actually getting value? from these particular asset classes and help us make a better decision when we do go to allocate from them. Since then, you, you've seen the CTI templates, which have, I wouldn't say become mandatory, but are suggested as good governance that the individual funds use. And it's my understanding that this is being rolled out to the DB schemes in particular outside local government as well. So there's a major focus on, on cost transparency. If you take it outside the United Kingdom, you know, some work I was doing for B Finance, you see the Royal Commission in Australia, where, where this is becoming a major focus as well. So I think the issue around fees and better understanding, especially in the private asset classes, is becoming important. And not just the regulator, but various bodies are, are taking note of it and putting things in place so we can better understand the fees we pay to help in better decision making when it goes to allocating money to different asset classes. But I'll still remain with my ethos, net of fee, risk adjusted returns, performance is what we should look at, not just the fee in isolation or not just the performance in isolation. Of course. And as you said, you do believe in active management. So there's obviously going to be a fee and that nothing comes yeah. out and that comes for yeah. free in that respect. Um, yep. So just going back to the investment um, profession in general. So you said you've always had an aptitude for maths. Did you have much um, knowledge of the world of investment when you were going through school? And what is it that you like about it now? So I'll be totally honest. I had my schooling in India and God's honest truth, no idea of the world of investments. None at all. Didn't know what equities, what bonds, none of that stuff. And to be fair, even when I came over to England, where I started college and then university, I still had no idea of investments. It's only when I started working in local government and a little bit of the treasury function for the council came under me that I had some understanding. But really, I only got to grasp with it about 10, 11 years ago. And I'm thankful that my then deputy chief exec ushered me towards this role because 10 years on, I think I've learned quite a bit. But more importantly, the learning that I've taken is one which says, you know, a lot of individuals at school have no idea about this. And it's now incumbent on people like me to get schools, universities, colleges involved to letting their students know that there is a world of fund management. And of course, that's relevant, not just from a financial literacy point of view, so that we oh. manage our own finance as well, but yeah. also, I think, to make view that there's a, a whole industry <laughs> there that is full of opportunity for all kinds of skill sets. Absolutely. You know, money management starts when the minute you understand. My son comes to me, oh, Daddy, I, I want to buy Bumblebee the transformer. I said, well, do you have money? He goes, no, you have money. I said, no, if you do some work, you get some pocket money and then you save that and then you can buy your bumblebee. And my son's, uh, well, he just turned five. So I think that starts from a very young age. And if they can grasp it at four or five years old, I think as they grow up, slightly more complicated tips on money management and investment, 
we'll get through to them. No, exactly. Well, we all have our, our own version of Bumblebee, what we're saving for. So I think that is yeah. important. Yes. So let's move now to the industry itself and the current levels of diversity in it, because this is really a follow on from the fact that the industry does not make itself particularly accessible or hasn't been historically. What are your thoughts on the current levels of diversity and uh, what you think needs to be done to improve things? So when we look at our industry, right, there's various stakeholders involved. So you've got people like me who are asset owners. You'll have the fund managers like your weavers and your LGMs. You have the consultants, actuaries, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think there's a little bit more diversity on my side of the fence, the, the asset owners. Not as much as we'd like, but relative to the fund management industry, uh, I think we're far better. I think the fund management industry is lacking massively representation from ethnic minority groups, specifically at the top tier. So when we look at the C-suite, there's genuinely a lack of representation over there. And, and this is not just in terms of ethnic minorities, but also in terms of genders, you know, male and female. So a lot of progress has been made with, with getting women to C-suite positions and board positions. But when you compare it to their counterparts, it's quite far behind. So I think there needs to be a move towards getting better representation across the investment industry. So what has the industry done? I think over the last three, four years, maybe there's been a lot of talk around it. And, you know, we acknowledge that it's not representative. We need to do this and we need to do that. But my view is slightly different. I think the time of talking has come and gone. I think now is the time for action. So actually doing things to make sure we are getting that representation is crucial. And whilst doing it, there's two things we should acknowledge. One, the people who are already in those positions, either at the C-suite level or at non-exec board level, there's nothing wrong with what they did. You know, they worked hard, they got those positions, and that is it. So we shouldn't hold them to account to say, well, you got this because of this, this, and this. What we need to do is address the problem. And you can address the problem at grassroots. So, for example, one of the things that my good friend Gavin Lewis, who's MD at BlackRock and myself started, is a Catalyst After School program. We trialed it last year for the first time with two schools in the city to set up a program with the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments. We coupled that with some fusion skills. So fusion skills are things like how to write your CV, presentation skills, you know, interview technique, things like that. We set up a program and we offered it to, to two schools. Surprisingly, <laughs> we were looking for about four or five sponsors to help us with this. We ended up with having over 20. So the industry is backing it. It's just up to us as individuals to come up with real life initiatives to actually get it out there. We should continue talking about it. There's no harm in doing that, but I think the time has come for action. And this CASP program, which I've just mentioned, is just one example. And you're also active on the Tackling Racism Task Force in the City of London Corporation. Can you talk a little bit about that work? Just as background, I'm also a politician, so I'm an elected uh, member, an independent, so not affiliated to any political party at the City of London Corporation. So amongst various other roles, I coach a Tackling Racism Task Force. So, so this was set up to ensure that the corporation is trying its level best to eradicate any form of racism across the city and the corporation. When we set out to do our work, we divided it up into, into six groups. So we divided it into education, into culture, businesses, policing, the governance of the corporation itself. So as in us as elected members and the staff. And the wrap around all that was health and well-being. And we spent what, about eight or nine months looking at every single section, so, so these seven different sections, in quite some depth to come up with recommendations as to how we can better improve or remove some of the issues that we find in the city. So that report was complete. It was approved in full. And those recommendations, as we speak, are, are being carried out. One caveat to note that, remember, the city is one of the oldest cities in the world. So there's a lot of history and tradition engraved in the city of London. And we need to be very careful how to balance what the modern city of London would look like, specifically with tackling racism, but also to remember some of the past at the same time. And finding that balance in some instances was a little bit of a challenge, but that's a summary of it. I'm happy to delve into any particular area in a little bit more, Ethan. Well, it seems extraordinarily comprehensive. I'm so impressed to hear about those seven substreams and the wraparound of health and well-being. And in particular, I'd love to just, you mentioned that balance between preserving history. We've heard a lot about the statues being removed and some kind of, you know, so the vestiges of the past being a painful reminder of a, a more painful past. 
as so I'd just love to hear a little bit about how, how you've balanced that. But also a second part of the question is, I'm sure you look at other cities because other cities also tackle these issues. What do you think London does well and maybe does, needs to do better in terms, of, in terms of these issues? Let me tackle the first one on statues. So that was one of those sticky points at the city. So for example, we have a lot of streets which have old names, right? So Jamaica Street, Plantation Street, things like that. And those have certain connotations to it. So one of the things we agreed to do was when we look at naming new streets in the city, this will need to be built in to make sure that we're not having these negative connotations when we go about doing our business. We looked at emblems and flags because that's something else that's very closely affiliated with the city and and things like that where we could see some connotations. The recommendation was we need to remove them as it were. Finally, on statues. So there are two particular statues which have come in for some criticism. So there's a statue of Beckford and there's a statue of Cass. Now, both of them were were aldermen in the city of London quite a few hundred years ago, but both of them were also affiliated with the slave trade. So that is a massive no-no. However, what both of them also did was contribute massively to charities and charitable causes which the world of the, the children of today um, and actually over the last uh, few years have, have been benefiting. So it's trying to balance, you know, the, what at the time they might not have realized was bad, but in our modern age is, is bad, to the good that they also did. So how have we gone about tackling this? So we did speak to, to quite a few other local authorities as to what they've done. And, and a few of them have taken statues down. A few of them are, are going through consultation like Oxford University. For example, and I think there was a report published a couple of weeks ago about Oxford University statue as well. What we've done in the city is actually open it out to consultation, so to members of the public. And we're going through that process right now to take on board their views as to how we should tackle this. What also makes it a little bit more complex for the city is that these two statues are located in a listed, in a grade one listed building. So if we were to do anything to them, we need to get planning permission anyways. So there's those complexities that even if the consultation and a decision was made to remove these statues, there are added complexities that we'll need to get planning permission. We've also had steer from government as to how they would like or suggested local authorities deal with this. So we've got to balance those things up. Now, these two statues have a further complexity that they're absolutely massive and cost a fortune. And there's a big insurance bill around it as well. So there's a cost perspective. So this consultation that we're currently doing at the minute is looking at all of that. And when the um, statues working group received the responses to this, there will be an analysis before a, a recommendation has been made. So that's the kind of long-winded answer to the first part of your question, Ethan. But I thought it's important that people listening to this understand the context behind it as well. Remind me again of the second question. Yes, sorry. The second question was just comparing London, say, to other cities. There is a perception, I mean, that London actually, that it's, you know, in terms of racism and race integration, does better than certain other cities around the world. So we need to acknowledge why London is slightly better. Because when you look at the population of London, by its nature, is very diverse. So, so you know, I, uh, earlier on in this in this podcast, I mentioned that I was born in India to a mixed family, and I came to England in you know, early 2000s. Why London? Because there's opportunity. So London is naturally an attractive position for more diverse people coming in, simply because of the opportunity, which maybe some other cities in the country or in the world might not have. So I think we need to acknowledge that. So with that mix of diversity in London, brings for a little bit more open thinking, brings for a lot more opportunity and better decision-making that comes with it. So hence why I think London is is slightly better than other cities. Other cities do speak to us. So so when we were going through the bulky work of our tackling racism task force, we spoke to the controller at New York State. We spoke to, I think it was a deputy chief exec uh, in Sydney, which looks after the running of the city of Sydney. We've spoken to people in Bradford. We've uh, from Bradford Council, we we've, we've been a major part of the um, of Mayor of London's Culture Task Force, where where they've looked at us and they've said, you know, there's some really good work you're doing over here. So we've not only spoken to people from various cities in London, but outside the country as well, where where they're looking up to to, to what we're doing. And the feedback that we received is that whilst most of the cities were focusing on flags and statues and street names and emblems, what we've done 
better, I'd like to think, maybe not the best, but slightly better, is that we've looked at everything. We've looked at our police force. We've looked at our education. We've looked at the culture. We've looked at businesses. We've looked at everything to do with this and not just focused on symbols in, in this instance, statues. So I think that's why London is slightly better, or the city of London at least, is slightly better as to how we've gone about tackling this. Absolutely. And my next question was around your clear commitment to public service in general, but to London in particular, over the course of your career so far. Clearly, you, you love the city. What are your views on how the city will evolve, oh, say, over the next 10 years? I mean, uh, do you see it returning to its former level of activity in life post-COVID? So the city of London has been in existence for hundreds of years, right, if not thousands, and it's survived. There's no reason why us as the nut and bolts and as the cog of London and in particular the city won't do our little part for it to survive another thousand years. It's, it's quite an interesting question you ask. So I'm currently chair of the city's 4.3 billion property portfolio. And your question is very relevant to what we're experiencing as a board. So if you look at the footfall, for example, in the city as a result of COVID, you know, it's nowhere up to the levels it was before, where anything between 27 and 33% of footfall, which is quite low, actually not quite low, which is very, very, very low. And that has a knock-on effect. We think of the city of London as all the big financial firms, the insurance firms, you know, the investment firms, so on and so forth. But actually, there are a lot more small and medium-sized businesses in the city as well. There's a lot of retail in the city. There's a lot of hospitality in the city. And all those businesses rely on us. So the ward that I represent, the ward of Allgate, is mainly an insurance ward. You've got Willis Towers Watson around Leadenhall Market. You've got um, Aon. You've got Marsh McLennan. And you've got Lloyds of London. So all those businesses, if they continue, if their workforce continue to work from home indefinitely, then the smaller businesses are affected, like Leadenhall Market, where, you know, they rely on the professionals coming in for a drink after work or for meetings over lunch or the tailor down the road who's making suits or the opticians where someone needs to go get an, get an item. So there is a massive knock-on effect. So what have we done to, at the city to help this? So we've come up with various initiatives to attract people to come back. So having things like rent deferrals, rent holidays, some breaks at some of the properties that we look after has certainly been helpful from the tenant's perspective. But we've also been engaging with um, quite a few senior associations, landlord associations, to see what's happening outside the city of London as well and what we can do to get people back. So there's surveys which we conduct with the major firms to see, you know, what, what are your instructions to, to your workforce coming back? And it sounds very promising. So in my world, at least, and this is a message that we see across uh, the city of London, is a lot of firms are encouraging their staff to come back, but, but not to come back on a five-day-a-week basis, maybe on a two-, three-day-a-week basis. But that's something we have to live with because us as a society have adapted to not physically needing to be at our desks 24-7. And that has worked. So we have to learn to live with that. So there is promise in coming back. What we've also seen, and this is a record year for the City of London as well, numerous amounts of planning applications coming through. So there is appetite for even businesses and developers to come into the city. I think it's a record year for us where, where planning applications have gone through the roof. Now, I personally go into the city once, maybe twice a week. And I can see it slowly coming back to normal. So that's the immediate things that we've, we've done over the last year, but you know, looking forward to the next year or two. Looking into, your, to answer your question, over the next 10 years, I think the city will be back to some level of normality because of these initiatives that we've brought in, but also long-term initi initiatives that we're looking at, like the city's taking our clean air and our climate change policy very, very seriously. And we're working with businesses to make sure that that's reflected in their operations as well, which then obviously has a knock-on effect for their workforce to, to come in a little bit more often. So I think the city will be there. The numbers certainly back it up, especially the planning application numbers that we're seeing. The nature of the insurance market, just speaking to a few brokers, they want to come back. So I think there's genuine appetite for them to come back. If you look at the demographics of people who work in the city, mainly tends to be a younger generation. They most definitely want to come back. Uh, and you see that in the investment industry, you, you, you see that in the insurance industry. And these are conversations I'm actually having with people, not, not secondhand information. So I think there is an appetite to come back. But when people want to come back, we need to balance it in terms of safety. And I think the government's approach of having a roadmap is, is definitely one that is worth commending. Safety first should, should always be the key, but at the same time, balancing it against cost 
needs to be taken into account. So, so hopefully by whatever it is, the 19th of July, where most of the adult population would have had both uh, vaccines and we continue to hope that both vaccines work, then I think we'll see a lot more footfall in the city and we will definitely continue even. Well, I can't tell you how good it is to hear that coming from someone who's deeply in the weeds of, of that process like you, because it's funny, on this podcast, there have been many, many professionals who've said that what it was that first encouraged them to enter the world of finance was the intoxicating feel, say, of walking over London Bridge and just feeling the buzz of the city, feeling just the, the sense of energy and just the sense of, of importance that, you know, working in the city and those crowds brought. And I don't think we should underestimate that, that there is that kind of ephemeral sense that, you know, when everybody's working towards, you know, something exciting on the business front, it, it really can, can be very motivating. And I certainly, for one, I'm delighted to hear that, that you believe that, that those days are not over for the city. So thank you for, for the work you're doing there. No, not a problem. I, um, I mean, I've probably got another 30, 40 years to work, right? <laughs> so I want to make sure it's there for another 30, 40 years at least. Exactly. Well, just going back now to your personal story, were there any setbacks or challenges or even investment mistakes that you've had over your career and what did you learn from them? One thing I go by is you, and, and this is a learning for me, you control what you can control and don't worry about the things you can't control. So one of the setbacks I had very early on whilst I was at college was not being accepted into the big accounting firms. So, so that was a big setback. And I realized the reason I, I, I didn't get through is because there are thousands of applicants and I didn't get three A's at my levels. I got two A's and a B or something like that. So that was a big setback, but it's what you learn from it. So, so my learning straight away was, well, if you're not going to accept me, I'm just going to find a, a new avenue to, to get into the world of accounting. So what I did do was speak to the director of finance at the college I studied. And I said, listen, I'd like to do some work experience. And she said, well, no problem. It'll be for two weeks and you won't get paid. And my response was, yeah, don't worry about the money. I want the experience, but can you give me something which lasts longer than two weeks? Because I don't think I can learn an accounting function in two weeks. And she goes, you can have it for however long you want it. So I ended up doing work experience pretty much nine to five whilst going to college for about 10 months at the college I studied. And then in that December, January, I, I was given a contract to work a three-day week in their finance department. So a setback was, yes, didn't get through to the big four, but then found another avenue, which got me a three-day a week job at the age of, or was I, 18, 19, at the college where I studied. And then they ended up paying for my university as well, whilst I still had the job. So by the time I finished university, I came out with five years accounting experience. So that was a setback, but that was my learning from it to, to find uh, another avenue. Some other setbacks that, that I would say were, were just, you know, coming to the country new. You know, all I've got is my mom and dad, like just trying to learn the culture, trying to learn the ways, you know, you're leaving a country where you lived for, for 16, 17 years, that culture and your friends totally behind and just adapting to a new way of life in the Western world was a little bit of a challenge. And that took me a good two, three years to, to adapt. But you adapt, you learn fast, you make opportunities for yourself, and you move on. <laughs> That's how I look at it. But those are just some setbacks from very early on in my career. Through my career, there have been one or two others. But again, I quickly learned that, Andrea, you, you control what you can control and don't worry about the things you can't control and find new opportunities where you can be a leader in. That's what I've learned, Ethan. Were there any key people or any key pieces of advice maybe that you received over that time that really stayed with you? Yeah, so, so there are a few key, key people. So, so the three beautiful ladies, as I call them, my nan, my mom and my wife, all three very supportive throughout my journey and giving me the belief that, listen, if you want to go for something and we know that you're a naturally a competitive person. So when you give, when you give something, it's a hundred percent, but if you're not committed, you, you wouldn't even get 1% out of you. So the minute I want to always do something. So whether it's a senior position in the day job, if it's a non-exec position, if it's a role as a politician or a diplomat, you know, when, when I've had these conversations and I was ready to go for them, I always approach the three beautiful women, as I call them, and taking their advice first. Along the way, I've, I've also had some really good mentors. Mike Suarez, who was executive director at Lambeth at the time, he was my mentor. And in my first session with him, he effectively said, he goes, Andrew, what's your, I'm going to give you three opportunities. Tell me what your key strength is. I got all three opportunities wrong to answer the question. I said, maybe I'm good with numbers. I said, maybe I'm good at sport. I said, maybe I'm a religious person. He goes, good answers, but that's not your, your true strength. And he said, your true strength is that you're good with relationships. 
and people. And the fact that the other three that you've mentioned come along are more secondaries. So that's one piece of advice that I'll always remember where he said, you know, remember, you're a people person. Relationship management is good for you. Being a good accountant, being good in investments, being someone who's religious, being a sports person, those are all added benefits. So that's one piece of advice, which I'll always remember. I had someone else that gave me a very, very useful piece of advice. And, and these types of advice, not just are specific for your professional job, but it cuts across your, your life as well, right? In, in your personal life was, again, being a competitive person. I think when I was younger, I sometimes forgot there's a line between confidence and arrogance. And I think sometimes, you know, if I was to tell my younger self, you know, I could have handled the situation better without coming across as, as an arrogant person, but showing my confidence in a more humble way, I think I would have I would have done a little bit better in life. But that's something over the last 15 years, I've, I've learned that, listen, if you are confident, just be a little bit humble when you come across, you don't need to be arrogant. Is there any creed or motto that you live by? There is one even that, that I do, and in exactly the order in which I'm about to say it. So it's God, family, career. So whatever I do, I, I tend to follow that path. So if it's playing semi-professional cricket on, on a Saturday, right? Prayers first, make sure the team and I do well. Babe, little men, I'm off. Give daddy a, you know, a high five, and then you go and deliver. Same thing with my career. Every time I, I'm looking at a new position, whether it's a non-exec position or head of something position, you know, faith in God, run it past the family and then go and deliver. So so God, family, career is is one which I which I live by and, and I try to get that message across to my two little boys as well. And just kind of following on from that, my last question is whether you would have any advice or what you would say to your younger self, maybe that young boy coming to college in the UK, anything that you know now that you wish you had known then? So so definitely be a little bit more humble. Don't think you you know it all. And that's one crucial piece of advice. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I, I think when I was young, I, I, yes, I did ask questions, but I could have asked a lot more questions, I thought. And even if you, it's it's a silly question, don't be afraid. Just, just ask the question and say, listen, I don't know this. Can you explain it to me? That's one piece of advice that I would have given my, my younger self. And then finally, a piece of advice that I would have given myself if I was younger was there's always opportunity. So don't feel afraid to look at new avenues. In my first two or three years in this country, if, if I had done that, I think I'd be in a better position. But I quickly learned that just because the door is shut somewhere, the, a window might be open somewhere else. So, so look at new opportunities as well. Well, thank you so much, Andrian. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for the tremendous work you're doing for the city and for the investment side of the, of the, the LGPS the pension funds. We are absolutely honored. I couldn't think of it, it, it to be in a better set of hands. So thank you for coming here and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you so much, Ethan. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest.